Hello everyone. everyone, thanks for joining us um, on our criminology session this afternoon. We will be beginning shortly, so if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Hi everyone and thanks for joining our online open event for criminology. Tonight I'm joined by criminology tutor Angela and we'll be discussing how to address knife crime in the UK. We'd really encourage you to get involved and ask questions on the topic as well as any other questions that you may have about the department. If you do have questions please put them in the Q&A box to the right hand side of your screen throughout the event and our team will answer these at the end of the session. So Angela over to you to introduce yourself and the topic. Oh, you just okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I'm Angela Tobin. I am a lecturer in criminology and criminal justice here at UCM Manchester. Um, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you um, about knife crime in the UK. There we go. Um, an analysis of the problem and how we've been responding to the problem in the UK. Um, you can see a selection of images here, faces, and you know whilst we hear about knife crime and victims of knife crime a lot in our media, maybe not as much this last few months because it's been a media that's been dominated by COVID and responses to it, but if you cast your mind back to beginning of March and prior to that, um, before COVID dominated our, our news, the, there was a lot of emphasis, there was a lot of talk about knife crime and victims and there was a lot of talk about numbers. And I think sometimes the problem with numbers is that we forget that behind each number, it's a person. It's a person with friends, relative, it's a, relatives, it's a person who's missing from our community, from school, from their places of work. Um, just a, as an example, um, we can see on the bottom um, right of the screen, um, Jaden Moody, he was 14 and he was knocked off a moped and stabbed to death in Leighton in East London on the 8th of January last year. Uh, we can also see Connor Brown in the bottom left. Um, Connor was um, 18 and he was injured after being stabbed in an alleyway um, in Sunderland. So, you know, knife crime is a, is a key problem um, in the UK and has been for, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's caused a lot, it's caused a lot of media coverage, certainly the last kind of 12, 18 months, two years, kind of pre-COVID. So, um, if anybody wants to have a little think about some of these questions for me, please. Um, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase knife crime? Who are the offenders, the victims, and how should this problem be responded to? They're the kind of things that I want you to keep um, in the back of your mind as we're talking through um, this presentation today. One of the big things for us to think about um, in criminology and whenever we're looking at any of the issues in criminology, we start by looking at the statistics, what the statistics tell us. In the year ending March 2018, there had been 285 NICE related homicides um, in the UK. 
and it was young men aged 18 to 24 who were most affected. So it was young men um, who were most likely to uh, die as a result of knife crime. And in the year ending March 2019, there had been 22,041 knife and weapon offences dealt with by the criminal justice system. And this represented a 34% increase since 2015. So that presents um, some key issues, some key problems for us to think about. A 34% increase over a four year period is something that needs to be considered and analysed. And this would form the basis of a key point of criminological concern. There'd also, um, from 2019 since 2012, been a 93% increase in the number of under 16s admitted to hospital due to knife attacks, a 93% increase. That's, you know, a, a, a huge increase that puts pressure on resources in a, in a number of ways. It puts pressure on resources in terms of hospitals and their responses. It puts pressure on police. Um, we're talking about under 16 year olds here. So these are young, vulnerable people, which puts a pressure on, um, on families, on schools, on the social services, on children's services that are there to support them. So all these statistics paint a very gloomy picture of the issue of knife crime in this country and reason as to why we need to analyse this subject from a criminological perspective. One of the first areas that we look at um, in relation to, to, to any issue within criminology is how the government responds to criminology. Now, there was an increase in the use of Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, and this gives police officers the power to carry out a stop and search without suspicion. Uh, the use of stop and search is a very, very controversial, um, it's a controversial power of, of the police in this country, and it's come under increased scrutiny, particularly since the, um, the murder of George Floyd over in America and the um, more public discussion about its overuse, uh, particularly amongst uh, young BAME males, so black, Asian or minority ethnic males. So this has been an issue that's caused a lot of concern because it is, you know, there's a lot of evidence, a lot of statistics that's been carried out, a lot of research that's been carried out um, into the use of stop and search, which has shown that it's disproportionately used against young uh, black, Asian or minority ethnic um, men. But there was an increase in the use of this legislation. In March 2019, £100 million was given to police forces um, in England and Wales to tackle the issue um, of knife crime. So that was an additional amount of money that was given to police forces to try and provide them with the resources, the material resources to respond to the issue. And in 2019, there was a new piece of legislation that was introduced. Um, this was the Offensive Weapons Act, and it saw the introduction of knife crime prevention orders. Um, there was a range of other things that was introduced to this, but essentially this legislation um, banned the selling of um, of knives to particular groups of people. So it was something that you could be given a prevention order that would prevent you from being able to um, buy a knife in the in, in the first place. Um, how do criminologists propose this issue should be responded to then? So that's what the government's doing. So we've seen, we've painted this picture, we've looked at the statistics that's shown us that there's been this significant increase in knife crime in recent years. We've looked at what government has done to respond to the issue. Now we're going to look at the work of some criminologists and how they propose that we should respond to the issue. Uh, Kayson and Haynes, two criminologists, have said that one of the key issues that we need to be really, really aware of is the toxic environment created by adults that children grow up in and the politics of austerity. So Case and Haynes are particularly critical of the fact that, you know, this increase in knife crime has come at a key period of time. And that is, you know, uh, after uh, up to eight years of austerity. Austerity was introduced in 2010 by the Conservative government or the coalition government of uh, the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. And it was introduced in order to try and balance the deficit 
um, that was caused after the 2008 financial crisis. Austerity refers to cuts in public spending in order to, um, to, to balance that deficit. So there's been a significant uh, decrease in the money that has been spent um, in a range of different areas that would um, support children and public services, be that in education, in the police, um, in uh, social services and children's services more generally. And Case and Haynes has argued that this creates a really toxic environment um, for children and it's a toxic environment that's been created by adults and we shouldn't ignore that in terms of our understanding um, of the issue of knife crime in this country. So to take this further and to kind of really illustrate how austerity is hit and how it has really had an impact um, on young people. In the six years prior to 2018, there had been 422.3 million reduction in the spending on services for young people. 422.3 million reduction in spending on services for young people. So that meant that a lot of the things, a lot of the tasks that people could get, that young people could get involved with, um, a lot of the support that was available to them was reduced significantly. In youth services alone, since 2010, since the introduction of austerity measures, uh, three and a half thousand jobs were lost in that area. 600 youth centres were closed and 130,000 places in youth centres were lost. And this represents the consequence of this, how this is experienced by young people, is it means that they can't go to um, places within their community uh, to, you know, for um, leisure purposes. They don't have a place to go and play pool, for example. Um, youth centres would um, frequently and certainly, you know, when I was a when I was a teenager, a youth centre would be the place where you'd um, have a local police officer who would um, attend sessions once every few weeks. But he'd be provide you with an opportunity to get to know um, your local police officer, which meant that if you knew the police officer in your community and there were any issues as far as knives and violence, etc., you had someone to turn to, someone to talk to about these issues. But the consequence of all these losses meant that, you know, there was a reduction in um, services available for young people to, to, to enter, to access. And uh, Case and Haynes in particular point to this as being a key factor um, as to part of this toxic environment that's been created for young people. Uh, research from Trainer in 2017 shows that the fear of victimisation leads to young people carrying knives. There has certainly been a lot of media representation about knife crime and that creates, it generates a lot of fear for young people. They become fearful. Parents are fearful of their children going out in, into the streets because of an increase in knife crime. And actually what that fear does is that they think if there's other people out there carrying knives, the best way to protect themselves is to carry knives themselves. This has been a particular concern for those people who feel that they aren't protected by the police or if they feel that they're discriminated against by the police. And this is certainly um, findings from some of the studies that have been coming out of Manchester University recently um, around young uh, black minority Asian lad, young boys who feel that they tend to have really uh, negative experiences of the police. They don't feel that they could go to them for support. Um, they'd be treated as a uh, as a suspect rather than supported as a victim. So that fear of victimisation combined with um, a lack of trust in the police can also create the problem of more and more young people uh, carrying knives. And then the more knives that are on the street, the higher the chance of knife crime being an, an issue. Um, Becky Clark's research has also shown that the increase in police power and the increase in the use of the Section um, 60 order that we mentioned in the last slide has led to more and more young people 
um, not trusting the police, so therefore wanting to carry knives in order to protect themselves when they don't feel that they'll be protected by the police. And this is all part of what Case and Haynes talk about was that really toxic environment that's been created. The fact that, you know, there's there's not the opportunities for young people to have to, to be supported in their areas. There's not the places for them to go for leisure um, purposes in evenings and at weekends, etc. And that combined with a lack of trust in the police, a lot of fear around young people because of all the media attention um, around uh, knives and, and, and knife crime and an increase in the police using um, stop and search measures to um, stop and search people without suspicion um, in case they are carrying knives. That's just created a really, really toxic environment. So one way in which this country is currently looking at responding um, to this issue is by following the model um, used in Glasgow. And the model that they used was all part of their violence reduction unit. Now, in 2005, there had been 137 murders in Scotland, 41 of which um, was in Glasgow. However, by 2018, the murder rate had fallen to the lowest level since 1976. So what criminologists are really interested in is what's happened in this period of time from 2005 when Scotland was described, uh, well, sorry, when Glasgow was described as the murder capital of Europe to 2018 when the number of murders had uh, dropped to the lowest levels since 1976. Criminologists look at this and say, OK, so what's happened in Glasgow? What have they done? Well, the violence reduction unit that was opened in Glasgow took the approach that serious youth violence, and that's the name that they prefer to give to uh, the, the youth crime problem. They call it serious youth violence. They said that it's a health issue and it's treatable and preventable. So just as the way in which we're encouraged to have a healthy lifestyle, to um, exercise, to eat healthily, to all these different things to prevent illnesses, and treat illnesses if we're suffering with health issues. The violence reduction unit started with that premise that we can treat and prevent the problem of serious youth violence, the term that they use to describe um, youth um, knife violence. And this approach, it was known, it's, it's called a public health approach, and they sought to uncover the underlying causes of violence. So what was it? What affected young people? Why did they become involved in violence? And they did this by talking to people who were deemed to be at risk of getting involved in knife crime. And the key um, response to these young people is that support was offered to them from a range of different agencies. So support was offered to them in terms of their health, uh, particularly mental health, certainly issues around alcohol and drug use. Um, help was given to them in terms of their education. Uh, statistics showed that the number there was a significant number of, of, of people who were involved in knife crime that had low um, attainment levels in education. So support was provided to them in terms of education in order for them to get the qualifications to, you know, provide other opportunities for them in life and support as far as housing too. So rather than you know, it was essentially the idea that the people who were at risk, they would be supported to provide them the support that they needed to have a good um, style of, of living in order to try and prevent them from committing knife crime and getting involved with knife crime. And it was this approach, this public health approach, that was really, really successful in Glasgow and saw um, the big decrease in terms of the number of murders that happened. Um, and this is the model that a lot of criminologists in this country propose um, should be used in, in England to deal with the problem. So the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow, they, the criminologists argue that we should use this model to try and prevent um, and treat the issue of knife crime so that we don't see knife crime uh, rates continuing to increase in this country. 
There are a number of key criminological issues in relation to this subject. One of the big areas uh, is issues around ethnicity and race, um, knife crime, and certainly media representations of knife crime pay a lot of attention to the experiences um, of young black uh, minority Asian uh, minority ethnic groups um, involved in knife crime. There's a lot of issues around media representations, how issues are represented in the media, um, scapegoats and moral panic, some of the key theories that we look at within criminology. Another one of the key issues in relation to uh, knife crime is the role of the police and the powers that they have and the impact that police powers have on communities. Uh, there are a lot of questions around punishment. How should we punish? Uh, knife crime offenders? How should we punish those people um, whose actions result in a loss of life, particularly of young people, or in, in serious um, harm being done? There's issues around the role of evidence-based policy. You know, what happened in Glasgow uh, was a significant reduction in knife crime. So surely, you know, a, a, policies that are adopted in England to respond to the issue should use this as an evidence base in order to inform their understanding and practice. And one of the other key issues in criminology that this um, this issue highlights is the politics of austerity, the impact that cuts on public services has had on different communities and particularly um, those communities that don't come from places of privilege and power. And another key issue that we look at in criminology is the idea of the view from below. Um, typically, when we hear about crime in the media, we tend to hear about it from officials, from police officers, from politicians. The view from below allows us to look at an issue from the perspective of the people um, who experience knife crime as victims or who are involved in knife crime as offenders. So that's another key issue that we would look at, at this issue um, from a criminological perspective. That's all from me. Is there any questions? Brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Angela. Yeah, we have yeah, we had have quite a few questions few. coming through. You just, you just read through them. Read them. So, so the first question is, what do you think the long term impacts on the justice sector will be post COVID? Oh, that's a really good one. So justice sector, um, I know certainly the courts and all the court systems have gone on hold for now. Um, because of um, issues around safety um, and reduced capacity. So this will absolutely have an impact. There's going to be an impact on um, prisons because although there was initially um, a number of offenders that were towards the end of their sentence, they were released. Um, but yeah, COVID absolutely will have an impact. It's going to slow things down. COVID has also had the impact that there hasn't been as much, you know, certainly during the period of lockdown, crime rates reduced. Um, so we could say that that was a positive, um, or, or, or sorry, I should say crime rates in relation to this area reduced. There was an increase in um, crime, uh, certainly issues around domestic abuse. Um, but knife crime as an issue uh, fell because people weren't out and about. Um, so, yeah, in terms of an answer, I don't think I have one, but absolutely it's 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 an evolving situation. And yeah, the, the COVID situation um, will absolutely have a have an impact on the justice sector. And um, another question we had for you, what can society do besides awareness campaigns? Um, Besides awareness campaigns, I think the things that we need to look at, um, as I've, I've kind of talked about, is, is the impact of um, things like the cuts to youth services that we've seen, the fact that um, there's been a, such a reduction in um, opportunities for young people to get support. Uh, Ooh, we seem to have just lost you there, for a second. Angela, just bear with us, everyone. Oh, we've got you back. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't know what it is. So I think um, rather than awareness, I think there needs to just. Oh no, it looks like we've lost you again. Just bear with us, everybody. Just waiting for Angela to get her connection back. We will just be a moment.
Are you there? You got it? Yes, we've got you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just dropped out there. We do look like we are having some issues with our with the connection. Um, we'll try and get Angela back and have a, have a go one more time. Angela, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, we've got you now, and then we'll just hopefully you won't drop off. Okay. So I'm sat right next to me, um, Ruth, so I'm not sure what the issue is. It's technology. Yeah. Did you get all the answers to the last one? I'm not, where did it cut out? It could just cut out at the start. Okay. Um, so I think the question was, what else can be done aside from um, awareness campaigns? Um, I think, um, you know, to go alongside awareness campaigns, young people need to feel uh, part of their community. They need to feel <clears throat> like they've got opportunities, um, that they need to feel that uh, they've got good reason not to get involved with these things, that they'll be able to, you know, live successfully without the need to get into these problems and to support young people when they do face problems. The people that get involved in knife crime um, aren't children who come from uh, wealthy, uh, successful backgrounds. They come from very dysfunctional uh, homes with problematic lifestyles, um, issues around addiction, um, do, they don't do very well in school and if more support can be provided for them to prevent those problems escalating then that would be um, one of the key ways to respond to this problem. Absolutely yeah. Um, another question we've had for him is more related to um, the course and um, well the career aspects that would be related to the course. So somebody said what kind of jobs can you do with a criminology degree? Okay yeah so I think the really obvious ones in criminology are to go and work in the criminal justice sector and um, so police, uh, prisons, probation, um, youth justice is another really popular one. Um, a lot of work within charities, um, a lot of work around domestic abuse, domestic violence, uh, drug work, working uh, with um, addicts, recovering addicts, alcohol services, um, but then there's also, um, you know, opportunities as far as careers in teaching, um, in uh, local government, um, looking at issues of importance such as housing and homelessness. I've had a few students in the last couple of years go and work in the homeless reduction uh, schemes that are involved um, in, in Manchester as part of Andy Burnham's commitment to, to end the problem of homelessness. Um, so yeah, really, a, a really vast range of uh, career opportunities for graduates. Brilliant, thanks for that. And um, somebody's asked, um, what is teaching like at the moment? Are we on campus much? Um, so we have a socially distanced timetable at the moment, which means you're in 50% of the time and remote learning the other 50% of the time. So our students are still um, experiencing the benefit of face-to-face um, -face classroom based teaching. We have had to adapt the techniques that we use. So for example, we can't do group works. Everything is socially distanced when we're in the classroom. But there's a lot of debates and discussions that take place in that environment. And then when our students are learning remotely, um, we're using all the various um, apps and features um, on Microsoft Teams in order to um, try and encourage students to engage with learning in a range of different ways from home. Um, so readings, quizzes, um, debates and discussions um, over the internet, uh, creating different um, posters on their computers and then presenting them to the group. Um, so yeah, we are trying to use as many innovative, innovative strategies as possible. It's great. It's all about just learning as you go, isn't it? And adapting to new ways of working. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The learning's the same. It just takes place in a different format. Yeah. Um, somebody else has asked, what topics do you look at in criminology? Ooh, so we look at a range of different topics. We will look at uh, the criminal justice system, um, how laws are made in this country. We will look at different types of violence, so knife crime being one of them. 
we will look at, we spend quite a bit of time looking at youth crime, uh, the reasons, uh, explanations of crime more generally, the theoretical um, explanations of crime. We will focus on key issues within criminology and, 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 and cases of crime that have really had um, kind of landmark effects in terms of the introduction of new law and policy. Uh, so, for example, we look at the murder of James Bulger and the impact that had on youth justice. More recently, we've been looking at the case of the Grenfell Tower disaster um, and the way in which that issue has been responded to. Um, we look at the role of um, partnerships and multi-agencies in, uh, in our responses to issues around crime and justice. Uh, and we also do research modules um, throughout the degree to um, where students are encouraged to take part in work-based learning, which is proven a little tricky um, in COVID, but that was certainly something that worked very successfully prior to that. That's great. So lots of interesting topics for someone who's wanting to go into a career in criminology. Um, somebody's asked, what is your experience within the sector? What are my experiences in the sector? Um, so prior to um, working uh, at UCM Manchester, I was an academic. I worked um, in universities. I was involved in uh, research around uh, sexual violence. Um, I was, yeah, have an academic background. However, my colleagues are, have more industry experience. Uh, one of my colleagues, Bill, he's a retired police officer. Um, he spent 25 years in the police service. Uh, my other colleague, Don, he was he worked in um, responses around youth crime and youth issues for Tameside Council. He was a director there for um, a big portion of his uh, career. Um, so, yeah, the staff that you would be taught by have a range of different um, academic and non-academic um, experiences, uh, qualifications and backgrounds. Oh, thanks for that. Um, another question that we've just had come through, is there any practicals while studying criminology? Not practicals. Um, the No, we do work based learning module in at level five. So in the second year of the foundation degree, there's a work based learning module. Um, practicals, no, but we, we, we normally do visits and have guest speakers. Um, where we used to run a trip to London where we go to um, the uh, Royal Court of Justice where we look at um, the uh, justice system and we, we visit Parliament. We um, go have a trip into Manchester where we look at some of the, the history of Manchester, particularly issues around rights, uh, the suffragette movement, um, the uh, beginning of the abolition of the, the slave trade when Manchester refused to, the factory workers were starting to refuse to use the cotton that um, had come, been harvested um, by slaves. So yeah, not practicals, but we do, we do kind of guest speakers and visits to uh, provide students with um, learning in a kind of more hands-on type way. Great, so lots of opportunities to, to get real insight, like you say, with people coming in and giving talks and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we've had a question from someone. Is it possible to work as a detective after graduating? Yep. So, um, in fact, just this week, one of my second year students, she's just got her first police badge. She's going to, she's was just starting with the um, it's PCSO. Uh, the specials and then that's what she's looking at after graduation what area of policing she's going to go into um but absolutely it's it's an opportunity um that you know once she's completed her degree um she'll be able she, she, the opportunities will be available to her to go uh, and to progress within the police yeah amazing that's great um, we've not had any more questions, I think that's the end of it. So is there anything you'd like to add um, just to round up the session? No, I think that's everything. Um, my contact details um, are available. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch, please feel free to do so and I'm happy to answer any other questions at a later date. That's great. Um, if you've got an email specifically, we can pop that in the um, in the box. Yeah, it's atobin at ucmmanchester.ac.uk.
Great, thank you. So we'll just pop that in the Q&A box. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We do have um, some further sessions, including the Future You Support drop-ins that are running up until tomorrow evening. Um, so please visit our website, usmmanchester.ac.uk forward slash online open days to register for any of the sessions. If you'd like to apply for USM Manchester for 2021, please visit our website um, to find your future course and hit apply. You can also find us on UCAS by searching USM Manchester. So all this information is going to be in the chat box as well. And we hope you've had a lovely evening. Um, and thanks again for joining us on our session. And thank you very much to Angela for that great information. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Bye.